Hey everybody, it is Drags once again, and this is episode 24 of the Jungle Roar podcast. Back to, to talking Cincinnati Bengals after last week's uh, expose with Tony Pike talking Bearcats, and looking ahead to what was unfortunately a loss to number one Alabama in the Cotton Bowl. That'll be Alabama and Georgia for the national championship this coming Monday in Indianapolis. But yeah, I know someone who uh, actually went to one of the schools uh, involved in the CFP uh, with said helmet over his right shoulder uh, is not happy about that. But uh, yeah, there it is. That's James Rapine. He is from allbengals.com, does a great job covering the Bengals for si.com. And James, welcome back to this podcast. Uh, You know, the Bearcats didn't win, but the Cincinnati Bengals sure as hell did on Sunday in I don't think it's hyperbole to say that was the best win in the history of Paul Brown stadium. You. Oh, Oh, let me think about that. Um, they didn't clinch the Oh five division in Paul Brown. Um, nope. That was in Detroit. Yep. Uh, so I remember that, uh, they clinched, uh, the division in Oh nine at Paul Brown against the chiefs, I believe. Yes. But that they did. wasn't, that, that was wasn't not like Patrick that. Mahomes and a super bowl, two time AFC champion team. Yeah. It was 17 to 10. And that wasn't really, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, am I missing one of these AJ green, Andy Dalton games? It, it doesn't feel like, so, it, so. I, I, he, here's the, the game maybe that comes to mind is the Monday mm-hmm. night win over Peyton Manning and the Broncos. Maybe that, that was a big game. That was a big yeah. win at the time in yeah. prime time. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that could, that could be it, but this is certainly up there. And, and for me, the reason it might end up being the best is because that could be the game that people remember as the jumping off point of the yep. Joe Burrow, Jamar chase, uh, this era of Bengals football, because a lot of it's going to go, going to get forgotten right but i remember exactly where i was when i watched the bengals beat the hell out of the detroit lions in 05 when they clinched at ford field yep. right i remember where i was when they uh, in the 09 season uh w- when they beat the uh steelers for the first time it was like oh my god they went on the road and beat the steelers it was crazy and so uh you have these moments that stand out and i think that was one of them for sure that uh, 10 years from now 15 years from now if this era is as successful as it can be everyone's going to say you remember where you were when they beat the chiefs and came back from three 14 point deficits so um and the other win over the chiefs the nine and O chiefs back in 2003 that was a watershed game at paul brown stadium no question about that the bengals were four and five going into that the chiefs were For sure everybody remembers uh they were nine and oh so um Okay, about that game, looking back on it and what you think James Rapine projects toward the postseason the most. Was it the defense? Was it the way they held Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey and company to three second half points? Or was it the play of Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow in the clutch? I think it's a fantastic argument. I want you to make a case one way or another. What do you think carries forward into the playoffs more? Joe Burrow. <clears throat> Joe Burrow, if, if they want to win and win a playoff game for the first time in my lifetime, the first time since January of 91, uh, then they, uh, they need Joe Burrow to play like he's playing. <laughs> and, uh, and that means not turning the ball over first and foremost, mm-hmm. but the athleticism, the ability to go off script, the ability to make honey badger look honey lost. I mean, it was wild. Uh, you know how Joe Burrow played on, on Sunday against that chiefs team down by 14 multiple times. So that's what they need. Now I get it. You know, the old adage defense wins championships and all of those things. I actually think this defense can be beaten and we've seen it at times this year. I'm not saying they're awful or anything or by any stretch, but when you're playing the quarterbacks that they're going to face in the postseason or the running games that they're going to face, and I'm saying Colts, you know, Patriots, that the coaches you need burrow to play at an extremely high level and that might not mean 41 points or 34 points but it means him playing better than the opposing quarterback than the opposing offense so what matters most quarterback play and what i think translates the most joe burrow and i'm not trying to jinx him i think he's playing better than every in any quarterback in the nfl right now that includes including aaron Rodgers. 
all of them. He's better than all of them the past couple of weeks. The numbers bear it out, but the eye test, you know what great quarterback play looks like. You've been watching number 12 for a long, long time. Number nine looks like number 12 out there with Rodgers' mobility. I mean, it's insane right now. So do, do you play him Sunday in Cleveland with the hope that you get the number two seed? Figuring too many things have to go right for them to get the number one seed. It could happen. The Bills win the East. Here's how it happens. Bills win the East. Chiefs lose on Saturday in Denver. The Titans lose Sunday in Houston. And the Bengals beat the Browns. Those four things. Okay. So here's what I would say. Um, it's up for grabs here. It's, it's, it's up for a couple of reasons. One, Joe Burrow. We've seen him play without taking all the reps in practice. Okay, give Brandon Allen more reps in practice this week. That's easy. Um, say, all right, guys, both be ready. Not hard to do. Very simple. I know Zach made it sound like it was rocket science. It's not. Both be ready. Prepare. Then watch the Chiefs on Saturday night and make the call there. If the Chiefs lose, if Denver shocks the world, if Drew Locke gets Drew cocky and, and goes crazy on Patrick Mahomes, well, then, all right, Joey B, let's go. Let's roll with it. And uh, and we're going to put you out there because we have a shot here at the one seed. Or the and, two. Uh, I mean, the two, oh, 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 as much and as. And the, the two matters. The yeah, two, two matters. The two definitely matters. Go it, explain why. Well, a couple of reasons. One, you could mess around and get the Raiders. If the Raiders beat the Chargers. Facing the Raiders in round one at Paul Brown Stadium, the Bengals would probably be four and a half to five point favorites they would yeah, be they, like pretty big you know and, and when you haven't won a playoff game in 30 plus years that's a that's a hell of a, a position to be in and then two you get a second home playoff game yes and so that part of it you only got to go on the road once potentially and and who knows what happens and, and the chiefs got to come back to you if you play the chiefs or whatever the case is it matters so I get it. I understand it. If Burrow's dinged up, you know, where he's 70% or something, well, then don't play him. But if he would play if, you know, you know in, in his 90% and it's just a matter or, or, or 100% and he's just hurting and you have a shot at the one seed or the two seed and the Chiefs lose, I, I say at least put him out there, play, see how the game's going and go from there, especially without Baker Mayfield, this, uh, this Browns team, I've seen them mail it in before. It's the only time Zach Taylor's beat the Browns it was at the end of the 2019 season. season. Uh, and I was at that game. I was covering it for Cleveland when I was still in Cleveland and uh, Odell Beckham Jr. Jarvis Landry Baker. They mailed that in and the, the Bengals beat them. I could see that happening again at this time at first energy stadium. Okay. I'll tell you what this weekend, James Rapine of all Bengals.com. They had better put freaking eight men, nine men in the box, the whole game right? There is no way you let Nick Chubb run for whatever he ran for the last time, you know, 165 yards and that 70 yard house or, um, that he had for the touchdown. You can't let that happen. And I think if they do that, they should beat the Browns. And, and the thing is, is if Burrow plays, you can do run game, quick game where you protect him some, uh, you know, because I, I think game script wise, you can kind of control it a bit more because I agree with you. you take away Chubb, um, but they don't have any they don't have any downfield threats. And I get it. There was a lot of motivation there and the Bengals turn the ball over and stuff. They're not playing that brand of football. Like, I think they're going to have a shot if Brandon Allen plays. I really do. But assuming it is Burrow. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. You just take away Chubb, make Case Keenum beat you. And he's capable. Well, who do they have out there? Chido Uzi is playing great. Eli Apple's playing well. Hopefully Trey Wayne's will be back. You're going to have this secondary, uh, pretty complete secondary. Trey Flowers. And Let's not forget about the job Trey Flowers did on Travis Kelsey. I thought that was one of the huge storylines of Sunday that really, you know, we didn't talk a lot about immediately after the game, but he did a tremendous job on Travis Kelsey. He did. And he did well against uh, Mark Andrews early in the season. Um, in week seven, he was early in that game. That was his first the game. Rams. I believe it, that he dressed with the, uh, with the Patriots with the bank. I knew I it took 24 episodes, but I finally had that 40 and slip. It was the first game that uh, Trey flowers dressed up with the Bengals was in Baltimore. Yeah. And, and so he, he's come along and look with, with who they could potentially have to play in 
this AFC playoff picture, you know, it's uh, it's certainly good to have someone like that. Now you're not going to have to worry about it as much, you know, David and Joku's capable uh, Austin Hooper, people in Cleveland are running him out of town. They hate his game right now. Uh, so that's uh, that's interesting, but there's no big tight end. That's as scary as some that you've seen, but in is a threat in the red zone. I do think that Joe Burrow, if there's something to play for, like a number two seed, he plays a quarter to a half, then he gets pulled. I'm curious to get your take on this. And I thought about this uh, on Monday. Do you think this argument is similar or very different than the discussion we had over Joe Burrow playing the final preseason game against the Dolphins? Complete. I mean, it's apples to, I don't know, sports but, cars. But the argument is, how much do you expose him? What's the benefit? What's the drawback? I mean, the drawback's obvious. He, he re-injures his knee or gets hurt. But the argument is, and who's pulling the strings on this discussion mm-hmm. to, on whether or not Joe Burrow plays in Cleveland? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's going to be an organizational decision that they all get together. Mike gives his input. Duke Tobin will give his input. The coaching staff, you know, Zach will represent the coaches. Maybe Brian Callahan's in that meeting. I think he probably should be. And Burrow will be involved too. Look, if the Bengals play Joe Burrow on Sunday, assuming the knee is okay, right? I'm not going to knock them one bit. Even if it's the whole game, if it's, I'm not, I promise you I'm not. He's playing better than any other quarterback in the league. And you could argue that just keeping him in that zone is important. And then you could argue the rest part is important, but the difference is the preseason game didn't matter at all. He was coming off of and hadn't played uh, coming off of a just awful, awful, gruesome knee injury. And we hadn't seen him yet. Well, we've seen him a lot this year. We've seen him take a lot of hits and we've seen him get up. And so to me, there's a big difference. There is still something on the line, even if it doesn't seem significant, it could be. And, you know, this coaching staff might want to just keep the momentum rolling anyways, win four straight going into the playoffs or the organization might want that. And I, I do understand that now if they get down 17, nothing or 24, just something insane happens where it's just, you know, at halftime, you look up, it's like, all right, well, what's the point now? Then I get it. But if they make the decision to play him, I'm not going to, I'm not going to crush him for it. I'm going to crush him for, you know, silly play calls, but I'm not going to crush him for playing their, their top quarterback. Okay. Let's go back to Kansas city. Everybody and their brother had a ancestor had uh, an opinion on how they handled the last two minutes once um, Joe Mixon helped them get down to the, you know, one yard line, or actually right before that, um, I think they had uh, first and goal at the three, then had a couple of shots. Um, no, they have, excuse me, back up. They had a chance to get first down uh, inside the one. They got that. They got that. And then Zach decided to go for the touchdown twice on quarterback sneaks tried to kill a little clock. When you look back on that, James Rapine, what did you think of the decision to not go for the field goal on fourth down? I understand. I understand. And I wasn't super critical, but by God, when you do that, (laughs) you have, you, you, it has to work. Like that's, that's the thing is, regardless of the numbers, regardless who's on the other side, it doesn't matter. It has to work because if not, then we're saying, well, your defense had only given up three points that they were well rested on the sidelines. There was less than a minute left. No time. And, and no timeouts. And again, your defense is playing great. Worst case, you give up the three and you play back and that's fine. Now you're going to overtime. And at the same time, with the way Burrow's playing, I understand trusting the quarterback. I'm not going to get in uh, get in the way of that. But I, I think that the calls in general, the quarterback sneak, the quarterback sneak, then, then you run the, the duo run play to mix in. And then it's like, all right, this is it. And it's to like this drop back, Joe finds someone. And I know, I get it with the void hit, you know. So and, and did you, it, go, you go back the, the, and look at that replay, James. I am Mixon not. What's that? I think Mixon got in, if that's what you're asking. No. Oh. <laughs> Do you think it was a sure thing Boyd gets that touchdown if he doesn't get hit? 
because you know we both we spoke to Tyler Boyd on the Monday Zoom call, mm -hmm. and he was convinced if I don't get yeah. hung up there, I'm catching that ball. That's an easy touchdown, and yeah. I I wasn't as confident. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it might have been a contested grab where the corner has a shot to bat it down. Honestly, and and Burrow might have hesitated because he was slower getting out of his break because of the the illegal hands to the face, but. I don't think it was a sure thing. Do I trust Boyd in those situations? Absolutely. Right. But man, it's just, th that's the thing. And, and, and that's the thing with this line. They don't get push up the gut. And so quarterback sneaks haven't worked all year. These, these run plays haven't worked all year in these short yardage situations. They've just struggled in. And, and that's the part of it. Like, I don't know about you, but I was one, I was like, man, are they going to score? I was less worried about the time, honestly, and more thinking like, are they even going to get in? And they I didn't. was concerned A after Mixon's run. I'm like, oh shit, they're not going to get into the end zone. And we're looking mm -hmm. at overtime or, or even worse. I, I knew when Mixon ran the ball and they came out onto the field, they were like, okay, we know we need a touchdown because Mahomes is going to march the ball down the field. They had, even though their defense had held them to three points, they had no confidence in the ability to handle Mahomes creating on his own. None, mm -hmm. zero. Sure. And I, I get it. I understand it, right? Because, you know, in that situation, if it's flipped, you're just hoping Burrow gets a chance and, and that offense can get back on the field. And it's Patrick Mahomes, former MVP, you know, Super Bowl MVP, you know, all of those things. So I'm just wondering, James, I, if they see Kansas City again and James and uh, Patrick Mahomes told Jamar Chase after the game keep doing you, we're going to see you again in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. If they see Kansas City again and that situation presents itself, and it, and it could be at Paul Brown Stadium again, we don't know yet, or even in at Arrowhead, I can't imagine they do the same thing on fourth down. There's no way they do the same thing on fourth down. To me, you have to have, and I hope to God they have it, there's got to be a play that's almost, that's cute a enough. Billy special? Uh, sure. But something that isn't beatable, like literally you're like, we're going to run this once. And when we run it, it's going to work all the time. Like, and I get it. It's not, it's impossible, but it, you can get damn close where it, it, there's enough motion. There's enough movement where you get someone free and maybe it involves Chris Evans. Maybe it involves a uh, drew sample. I don't know, but someone that what, where you just catch the defense completely off guard and you have option one, two, three, <laughs> You know, he uh, talk about the dogs barking. That's a, that's appropriate, James, because they are in the dog pound this weekend. Continue. Uh, your mic's off. We good now? Yeah, we're are good. We good now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So anyway, sorry about that. Finn says hi, by the way, uh, hi, I was Finn. having something to deliver. I don't know. I probably some kind of package. Go to bed, Finn. Anyways. Um, yeah, I have something in place that you dial up that's almost foolproof. I'm not saying like a, a hook and ladder for a two point conversion like the Rams, right? I, I so it needs to be cute, but not too cute. And there, there's, I'm sure there are, you know, Zach Taylor and Brian Kelly probably have a play or two. Make sure you have that because I get it. I love the aggressiveness. But when you do that, there are times when you make that call where it has to work. Otherwise, you're going to get ripped. And it's a results oriented business. And sometimes, and I get it with all the analytics and stuff, people are going to say, oh, it was the right decision. Well, sometimes the right decision is getting it right. And if you don't get it right, then you're wrong. And that's just it yes. in, in any business. And I know that sounds wild to some, but that's how I view it. And, uh, and sometimes as a head coach, you have to find a way to get it right. So hopefully they have a, another player or two for when that does come down the line, because it's not just Mahomes. You know, Josh Allen's capable of that. There are a lot of quarterbacks in the AFC, I think, that are capable of, of scaring you essentially into to going for it uh, if, in that type of situation. If they see Kansas City again, there is no shot, right, that Steve Spagnolo goes with man coverage on Jamar Chase. It has to be more aggressive. And that's what Andy Reid was ripped about after the game is how can you let a guy who is that good and that talented go man-to-man -man the whole yep. game, essentially. Let me ask you this. 
would Bill Belichick, if, if the Patriots come to town, you think Bill Belichick is going to double chase or do you think he's going to go single coverage? He's going to go. I actually asked uh, Evan Lazar, our CLNS uh, correspondent covering the Patriots, uh, that very question. JC Jackson would start on Jamar and he would get help. They would bracket him. They'd do whatever. They'd cloud him. Um, but I think they would start with JC Jackson and man coverage. And then the second that Jamar starts winning battles, they, they make an in-game adjustment and say, screw it. We're not going to let Joe just, you know, F it. Jamar's down there somewhere. We're just going to throw the ball up yeah. on third and 27. Um, Bill wouldn't let that happen. And I think that's, that was a, that's what surprised me on Sunday is that the Chiefs really didn't do anything special. The conspiracy theorist in me thinks that there's a reason the Chiefs did that, and that's because – they knew they were in the playoffs. If they see the Bengals again, Steve Spagnola is not going to show the Bengals what they're not going to put on film, what the Bengals are going to get in a playoff game. I mean, honestly, if I'm the Bengals, that's fine. Like cloud chase, double chase. Like that's the thing is I, I think Burrow has a lot of the answers to the puzzle now. And the one thing this offense has shown is the ability to adjust. So uh, if he's facing Bill Belichick and they they single cover him for three drives and then Chase has three catches that lead to even a field goal and they're like, all right, well, we're going to double you now or, or cloud you at least. Well, then they're going to adjust right away and, and look elsewhere. And th that's T. the part. But T, Tyler, I mean, I, I think that that's the, the tough part when Burrow's playing at this level is you're going to get beat by someone unless you just hit him and just hit him so much that he's just you know, off his rocker almost. And I don't mean like concussed. I mean, where he's not seeing the field well and seeing ghosts to do that. Right. And, and yeah. And, and we haven't really seen that in weeks, even though he's taken a lot of hits. And so if he's playing at this level, it's really a pick your poison where if, if these guys are playing even to 80% of their potential, this offense should be able to move the ball. So what's interesting to me about that, James, is you, you mentioned Belichick, you mentioned what the Patriots would do. And I went back and I watched and, and, and read about uh, Super Bowl 36 when they faced the greatest show on turf in the, in the St. Louis Rams. That was an offense that had Tory, Tory Holt, Isaac Bruce, Marshall Falk, and Kurt Warner. I don't think Kurt Warner is as good a quarterback, pure quarterback, as Joe Burrow. I think he's a great passer, obviously, Hall of Famer. But... To your point, the way Burrow is playing at that level, it's a different animal, I think, even for Belichick. And I think at some point, Belichick is going to say, you know, maybe we go cover seven. We just take everything away deep and, and force Burrow and the Bengals to be patient. And that is sometimes the way Belichick approaches an offense like this. Hey, look, we know you, we ha you have all of the weapons in the world. We're not going to try to take away you know, one thing which Belichick is famous for doing, we're just going to take a different tack. We're just going to take away everything deep. You take your, your, you know, short gains underneath, and then we'll see if you can put a drive together. Yeah, I, I could see that. And I think he would find a way to get pressure too, without necessarily blitzing. Cause I, these teams in the playoffs, man, they're going to be like, Oh, that's your line. That's the interior of your line. We're going to light that up. Quentin Spain's coming off of an injury potentially, or, or you're rolling with a, right. a rookie on one side and a second year, sixth rounder on the other. I mean, three fifths of their line potentially if Spain's out is going to be huge, huge question marks going into it. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with you though. And I do think to Burrow's credit, he's shown the ability to be patient, right? The Denver game was certainly a game where it was like, okay, I'm gonna that's take a great what's there. point. Yes. We'll, yeah. We'll make the play when we need to, but I'm not going to turn the ball over because that's, what's going to cost us. And that's kind of how I think the Patriots would want to play it too. And uh, they have a quarterback that's certainly capable of, of protecting the ball for the most part. They're confident running it and, and doing that. So it'd be a really interesting matchup. You know, I think the, the Colts would try to play that way against this Bengals team as well. Um, where they try to light up Burrow, get him, you know, get, get pressure on him and then lean on their ground game and say, Let, let's see, you know, let, let's see what happens from there. We've seen the Bengals against the Raiders, one particular, uh, one possible opponent. We've seen them against the Chargers. 
we have not seen them against the Colts and we haven't seen them against the Patriots. The thing that concerns me against the Colts and the Patriots are, is the inability occasionally for the Bengals to stop the edge running game. We, we know that the Bengals can stop them up the middle with Ogan Joby and reader. We know that they're both healthy and the middle of the Bengals defensive line has certainly been an anchor. It's certainly been a strength of this defense, but when you're talking about Jonathan Taylor or you're talking about Damian Harris and Ramonde Stevenson for the Patriots, that concerns me. And I don't know if the Bengals in a game like that uh, have the wherewithal to stop the run. Yeah. I mean, it would be one. It's great that Logan Wilson had, you know, was able to return and, you know, that you would need 55 and 57 Wilson and Pratt to have really good games in that situation because Trey Hendrickson, as good as he is, it's not great in the run game. And, you know, I would run at him. I would run at that side. I would try to uh, push it that way. No doubt. You don't want to run up the middle. You want to run over there um, and, and see what, you know, you can do on that. On the flip side of that, the Bengals do have Hubbard on the one side. So if it's, you know, just Wilson and Pratt, just finding a way to, to plug up that, uh, what is it? The left side. Then I, I think that's, you know, they're capable of doing that at least to a degree. Uh, in you know the Bengals can adjust to it. I, I thought the 49ers were going to do that, just run at Hendrickson all day long, uh, way back when the Bengals played the 49ers, and they had some success, but it wasn't as. Awful. They had more success with Kittle once they got once Kittle got involved in that game. They were going to go back to that, and so that's the thing. If you're the Bengals, it's like you look at the Patriots. There's no real weapon, like just singular weapon. That's Hunter you Henry is the is the one. He's thing. good. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, he's good and he's great in the uh, you know red zone, and you'd have to pay attention to him. But he's not on the level of some of these guys, right? That you've seen this year: Darren Waller, Travis Kelsey. Um, yeah, obviously, you mentioned George Kittle. So, Mark Andrews. He's not even on that level. And I'm saying even he's still probably a top tight, ten tight end in the NFL. But uh, you're, you're not shaking in your boots as much. So that's the part of it where it's like. Yeah, the Patriots aren't that scary, but they also have the greatest coach ever and a capable defense. And he did once upon a time make Peyton Manning look human multiple times. And that's the scary part. Yeah, but with a much better, deeper defense. I mean, look, Matthew sure. Judon was great at the beginning of the year, but he's worn down now. And he's not playing the same, nowhere near the same level of defense uh, on the edge that uh, he was at the beginning of the year. We're going to wrap it up here, uh, James Rapine. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to take your pick, make you take your pick. Hmm. Of these four possibilities, what do you think is most likely and least likely? Okay. Zach Taylor, c- along with uh, Matt um, LaFleur of Green Bay, are odds on favorites for coach of the year. Zach Taylor, coach of the year, Jamar Chase, AFC offensive rookie of the year, Joe Burrow, MVP Bengals win the Super Bowl. Whoa. Okay. Well, Chase better damn well be offensive rookie of the year, because if he's not, they need to get rid of the award. So that's most likely even over Mac Uh, Jones. Let me tell you my theory behind this. Go. And, That's uh, why we have this it, podcast. <laughs> and, and I think it's uh, it's pretty simple. And even Patriots fans out there should admit this because I don't think this is bias. I think it's just obvious. Mac Jones is having a great rookie season for a quarterback. No doubt about it. Is the best rookie quarterback in the NFL. But among quarterbacks, He's having an, he's an average starter. You know, he's having an average season. He's a pretty good starter. I'm not knocking him pretty good. Jamar chase is having an historic rookie season among rookie wide receivers. And when you compare him against just wide receivers across the league, it's elite. And his impact on the Bengals offense, as you know, far exceeds just the number 79 receptions, 1,429 yards, 13 touchdowns. It's a, uh, you know, the run game, how well he blocks, his ability to free up T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd, the fact that Bill Belichick is going to be staying up late trying to prepare for him or whoever, Steve Spagnuolo or whoever. I mean, he single-handedly lit a fire under the Bengals' offense the other day in in what was the biggest game of the year against the Chiefs as a 21-year-old rookie. So to me, Mac Jones, great year, but 
it's not to me it's not close when you look at the numbers now even if jamar doesn't play on sunday fair point so i would put it as uh most likely offensive rookie of the year and if not again they should just put it qb roi you know quarterback rookie of the year mm-hmm. or rookie quarterback of the year however you want to uh change that um and then you had zt coach of the year uh burrow mvp uh the next most likely is zach taylor coach of the year he wouldn't be mine but I understand it. I would probably say Mike Vrabel and what he's overcame in Tennessee. I know that's weird, right? That's shocking. And LaFleur is right there too. I have him out of Zach, but Vrabel, you lose AJ Brown for an extended yep. period, Julio Jones, Derek Henry, they all go down. Uh, Ryan Tannehill is his quarterback. And I know people think Ryan Tannehill is good. I think the Bengals would love to see the Titans in the playoffs, especially if they don't have Derek Henry, they will, but you get my point because yes. it's Ryan Tannehill. Um, but, but still most, the least likely Zach Taylor coach of the year. I do think for what it's worth Burrow winning, um, comeback MVP. player of the year. Oh, comeback, comeback. player of the year. Right. 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 Would be ahead of Zach Taylor coach of the year. It wasn't an option. I'm just pointing it out there for those wondering. Got it. Then I'm actually going to put Bengals super bowl, which is extremely unlikely, but you know, it's there. Um, and then the last one would be Burrow MVP. And that doesn't mean that he isn't the MVP because I think people struggle with this. When you look at value, valuable, Joe Burrow should be, you know, top three in the MVP voting even before the past couple of games because of how much he means to the franchise, but people look at it differently. Um, but Aaron Rodgers is going to win the award. My three would be in no particular order, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Joe Burrow, I just don't think Burrow has a shot to win it now, even though the numbers are insane. Now, if he goes out there, plays the Browns, throws for 500 yards and five touchdowns, and they score 50 Which in Cleveland. Which I doubt is going to happen because I, I just don't think they'll expose him that way, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think it's going to happen. And even then, I still think Rodgers probably wins it. But he, he, the, the path to it would be that happening and then everything happening in front of the Bengals for them to get the one seed. Because then you say one seed – worst to first by week has the numbers, you know, then maybe, but it's a long shot. So I would put the Bengals making a Super Bowl run ahead of it because one, I think Rogers is going to win the award Two, when you have Joe Burrow and you have these weapons in a competent defense, I'm not discrediting the defense. I think you're always going to have a shot. Are they going to be able to string together the three wins required to get there? I, I don't know about that. I think it's unlikely, but I, I do think that there is a chance. So I would put that ahead of Burrow winning the MVP because I just I think it's too little too late. But Trags, it might be setting the stage, much like it happens in college, where a player excels at the end of the year and then suddenly they're right. the Heisman front runner. I could see Burrow winning the MVP next season. Anything else on your mind? No, not you're really, gonna be in um, Cleveland. Oh yeah, I'm going to be in Cleveland. We're going to have to get a you know a pop or two. Uh, we are, and I will be making the trip up. But I might be making the trip up uh, in the morning, oh, early in the morning. You're goodness. going up the night before. Oh yeah, I have, I see. I have friends up there, so I'm actually going up Friday. Yeah, you know, so uh, see some old buddies, some old pals from my Cleveland days. Oh, that'll be fun for you. Uh, kind of like uh, what I could be experiencing in a couple of weeks at PBS. Do you want that to happen? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I want to see Bill coach against Joe Burrow I, and, and this offense. It is, you know, it's ironic because Belichick began his tenure in New England coaching uh, one of the great, everybody points out his game plan from Super Bowl 25 when he was the DC with the Giants against the Bills. Uh, and that one's in Canton. The, the job that he did, Willie McGinnis did on Marshall Falk and Super Bowl 36, among the greatest coaching jobs ever performed, just unbelievable. I want to see Belichick coach against this offense, this Bengal offense in the po- po- uh, postseason. I think it would be fabulous theater. Who's going to guard Chris Evans, the Bengals Marshall Falk? <laughs> ah, boy. I don't know. I I'm just kidding. A, yeah, I. I know you're, you're comparing Chris Evans to Marshall Falk, but I, um, that being said, if you want the wrinkle, cause I don't think I'll be on here again before the playoffs. Maybe, maybe uh, I will. I'd be great. But uh, the wrinkle in this offense, the untapped potential, the thing that they might be hiding 
is the Chris Evans wrinkle. I agree with that. I think that is uh, an astute observation, James Rapine. We'll astute. See. But I, I don't think there's much else. I don't think they have anything else in the back as far as like players to use. You know, I don't think Auden Tate is walking through that door yeah. and saving the no. city. You know? No, 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 no. So, so to me, it's it's Chris Evans. So uh, Drew Sample. It, it, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we laugh. But he might, he might, yeah, he might have that two point conversion or that big touchdown there, where no one expects I him to catch just it. I get, get it. the sense they love Drew Sample, and I think they're saving him for like not to use him. I'm not talking about 20 snaps a game. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in a particular situation where everybody else is covered uh, in a two tight end set you know, in a 12 personnel and he yep. comes out and he is left wide open, kind of like Blake, uh, Bortles of uh, Blake. What's his name was the other day, Blake. Um, Oh God, Blake bell. How many people knew of Blake bell before Sunday? Who are we talking about? The chiefs tight end oh, on the other okay. side of Travis Kelsey. That's exactly okay. my point. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that yeah, is yeah. exactly. I, dude, I just point. covered the game and I, I was busy, man. I wasn't worried about Blake Bell. Blake I'm Bell, I thought you were talking about Blake Snell. I've... <laughs> Blake Bell had three catches on three targets, 35 yards, including a 24 yarder down the seam. Yeah, the 80, number 81. I, you see, I know his name or his number. I just. And he had a direct snap as my voice he, cracks. He did. Dude, that was a hell of a play call. I love that. That was a the, hell of a play. What? Under center, right? quarterback sneak for a first down. Those are the type of wrinkles I think they have in their back pocket right now, for sure. All right. He's James Rapine. I'm Trags, Mike Petralia. You can follow James Rapine on Twitter at James Rapine, all one word, correct. And uh, you can also follow his great work at allbengals.com. Anything else you want to plug? Um, on, on Tuesday morning, I put out a column on all Bengals about uh, – Kind of comparing this current team and specifically Chase and Burrow or Burrow and Chase to, you know, the Chad Palmer era, the Dalton Green era. Because to me, I lived through both of those eras. Yeah. I think this one's better. And we haven't seen much of it yet, but I, I think I think people will like what they read when I uh, when they check it out at allbengals.com. There you go. He's James Rapine. I'm Trags. This has been the Jungle Roar podcast. <laughs>